in Edinburgh. Police Scotland are investigating the sudden disappearance of a much-loved daughter and sister. It's just really happy go lucky. Lucky is a lot of friends. She was cycling and just things like that. Just love the love. Just love the outdoor life. I'm doing things for charity. And she was always smiling. Suzanne Pilly was a 38-year-old woman. She worked as a bookkeeper in the city centre of Edinburgh. She was a very outgoing person. Um, she had a large circle of friends and she was really close to her family. On the 4th of May 2010, Suzanne didn't turn up at work. It was completely out of character, so her colleagues got in touch with Suzanne's family, who then called the police and reported her missing. So the police had uh, gone to her workplace that the following day to start to make inquiries that could possibly help them to determine what happened to Suzanne. Alongside their inquiries at Suzanne's workplace, police began an extensive trawl of nearby CCTV. This is actually an enormous task because what we do is we collect CCTV from any available source. Imagine a city centre, there's cameras everywhere. But we had to cover every single possibility. We had to establish that Suzanne had actually made it to her work. We were able to piece together her last movement. We were able to establish that a neighbour had seen her leaving the house just after seven. We were able to establish that she had taken a bus, two buses, into the city centre. She had left the bus in the city centre, which was normal. She had gone to a local Sainsbury's, purchased some breakfast, a yoghurt, and were able to watch her walking across St Andrews Square and disappearing um, round the corner. The last camera is just a matter of 60 metres from her door. There's a void space between two cameras, and that's where the front door to her office is. We could establish that she hadn't continued past her work, she hadn't returned, uh, she hadn't gone straight over into another street. If she had done so, we'd have been able to see her in CCTV. So Suzanne must have made it to work that day. It made no sense. How could she have got so close to her office, but not arrived at her desk? Police examined Suzanne's phone and emails for any clues. It became very clear very quickly that Suzanne was having a relationship. David Gilroy was a, a colleague, very effective at work. He was a problem solver. He was highly regarded within the office. He was a married man with two children, and uh, he was clearly in a relationship with Suzanne, and no one else in the office knew anything about it. From emails and phone messages, Police could see that Suzanne and David Gilroy were in regular communication, so they wanted to know if he could shed some light on her whereabouts. They've got through to him on the phone, and he told them that he was he'd gone off to a site visit in the west of Scotland, a considerable distance away from Edinburgh. And through the course of the conversation, they'd asked him if they'd come back so that they could speak to him, and he agreed to do that when he returned. It was 11 p.m. Uh, when he finally got to the police station. So I had to not be at work then, so no one to know where When the officers finished the interview, they noticed marks in the back of uh, Gilroy's hands. He said that they'd been as a result of gardening. She was being wearing a pair of gloves. He was asked if he'd come in the following day to have those marks photographed. The officers dealing with him realised they had concealer, some sort of makeup, which there immediately they felt was, you know, unusual, suspicious. Gilroy's account of how he'd come by those marks through gardening didn't check out. When the officers checked, there was no sign that any gardening work had been done recently. We realised then that Gilroy was a suspect. Police had also been told by Suzanne's friends and family that she wanted to end her relationship with Gilroy. In the three weeks before she vanished, Gilroy had called and texted her 450 times. 
But on the day she went missing, all the calls stopped. We were also able to establish that Suzanne's uh, mobile phone had stopped speaking to the network uh, at three minutes to nine. With Gilroy as their chief suspect, police started to piece together his movements on the day of Suzanne's disappearance. CCTV showed David Gilroy had taken the bus to work that day and had arrived at around 20 past eight, shortly before Suzanne. He had logged onto his computer but was away from his desk for a full hour. Later, he returned home and collected his car, driving it back to the basement of his office. We knew that Suzanne hadn't been abducted in the street. She hadn't been bundled into a car because we had traced all the vehicles. So there was no other explanation. So we knew that Suzanne had made it into her work that day. It became clear that we needed to somehow carry out a forensic examination of what is a very large building. On the 9th of May, five days after Suzanne was last seen, police deployed cadaver dogs in the basement of the office in Thistle Street. These dogs are specially trained to help us in the search for, for bodies. The dogs could signpost where we would want to then begin you know, detailed forensic work. In three distinct areas, they gave a reaction to their handlers. The area under the stairwell, an area leading from the stairs, and that is just short distance to a fire door, and beyond the fire door into the garage itself. And most significantly, they reacted when they examined the boot of Gilroy's car. Police were now confident they had a picture of what had happened to Suzanne Pilly. David, how many times do I have to say this? Okay, it's finished. It was clear that Suzanne had ended the relationship. There's, there's, there's nothing you can say. And clear that he didn't want the relationship to be over. It's over. And down in the basement, he's murdered Suzanne. And all his actions after that are about covering up. <laughs> if David Gilroy had murdered Suzanne Pilly, what had he done with her body?